call it when your patient with type 1 diabetes refuses to take their insulin. We call it INCIDENCE. <laughs> <laughs> and one day a patient with diabetic went to his primary care physician and he said, Doc, the problem is that diabetes runs in my family. The doctor turned around and said, No, my friend, the problem is that nobody, nobody runs in your family. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, it's Ryan here. I hope you and your family are well. Today we're tackling a problem in society in general, diabetes, but we are focusing on type 1 diabetes. Here is a breakdown uh, of what we're going to cover. We're going to start with a handy clinical question. Then we're going to break down type 1 diabetes in terms of our cardinal headings, etiology and classification, pathophysiology, how do patients present in terms of signs and symptoms of disease, differential diagnosis, diagnostic evaluation, treatment and management. Then we're going to cover prognosis and complications and end off with encouragement from the Word of God. So please note, guys, that topics of diabetic ketoacidosis and type 2 diabetes mellitus we will be covering in a subsequent video. This video is just meant to cover type 1 diabetes mellitus. God bless you. Thanks for joining me. Let's get stuck into today's clinical question. All righty. Uh, just get my pointer in there. All right. So which of the following statements regarding the epidemiology of diabetes mellitus is true? That option A, which says neither type 1 nor type 2 diabetes are increasing worldwide. Is it B, the prevalence of type 1 and type 2 diabetes is increasing in the states but not worldwide? Hmm. Option C, the worldwide prevalence of type 1 and type 2 diabetes is increasing. Option D, the worldwide prevalence of type 1 diabetes is increasing but type 2 is decreasing or is it E the worldwide prevalence of type 2 diabetes is increasing but type 1 is decreasing hmm. well I wonder so guys this is the definition of diabetes mellitus as per the SEMSA SEMSA stands for Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism and Diabetes of South Africa this is the definition diabetes mellitus and there's a couple of uh, important words here is a metabolic disorder with heterogeneous etiologies characterized by chronic hyperglycemia and disturbances of carbohydrate, fat, and protein metabolism, resulting from defects in insulin secretion, insulin action, or both. Beautiful. As we know, diabetes mellitus is a major independent risk factor for coronary and peripheral atherosclerosis. Uh, the Diabetes Control and Complications trial showed that strict glycemic control can delay the onset of microvascular complications, that being retinopathy, nephropathy, and peripheral neuropathy, and slow progression of existing complications. Even though diabetes mellitus is divided into type 1 and type 2, which we'll talk about, it exists along a continuum, and significant overlap may indeed exist in terms of presentation, symptoms, management, and long-term prognosis. <clears throat> so, focusing and honing into type 1 diabetes today, it occurs due to an autoimmune destruction of the insulin-producing beta cells of the pancreas, which then results in significant insulin deficiency. Patients inevitably require regular insulin supplementation for survival. As we know, glucose is toxic to the nerve cells, so it causes neuropathy. It's toxic to the blood vessels, causing heart disease, kidney disease, peripheral uh, vascular disease, and hypertension. It's toxic to the retinal blood vessels, causing blindness and retinopathy. We know there's different stages of that and many other cell types. And actually, the glucose toxicity is manifested by your uh, advanced glycated end products, right? Uh, like sorbitol, etc. Type 1 diabetes accounts for approximately 10% of diabetes cases. All right, this is the breakdown of the uh, varied etiologies, the heterogeneous etiologies behind diabetes mellitus. So we know that it's type 1 diabetes with its beta cell destruction, usually leading to absolute insulin deficiency, which can be immune mediated or idiopathic. Then we have type 2 diabetes which may range from predominant, uh, predominant insulin resistance with relative insulin deficiency to a predominantly secretory defect with insulin resistance. I watch out for clinical stigmata of insulin resistance in these patients, uh, like acanthosis, nigricans, and skin tags. Also includes a subset who have ketosis-prone diabetes. Other specific types, there's a whole truckload of them, guys. Genetic defects in beta cell function, where we talk about MODI, maturity onset diabetes of the young. Then there's genetic defects in insulin action. There's diseases of the exocrine pancreas, chiefly pancreatitis, neoplasia, cystic fibrosis, hemochromatosis, other endocrinopathies like acromegaly, Cushing syndrome, glucogonoma, phacromocytoma, hyperthyroidism. It could be drug or chemical induced, and then we have glucocorticoids, nicotinic acid, beta agonists, phenytoin, 
right? Highly active anti-survival therapy, especially of protease inhibitors. Infection mediated, and then we have congenital rubella, CMV, uncommon forms of immune mediated diabetes and other genetic syndromes, right? There's also a very important group here, which is mentioned separately in terms of hyperglycemia first detected in pregnancy, <clears throat> which can be gestational diabetes or can be pre-existing diabetes in a pregnant uh, lady. <clears throat> Looking now at disorders of glycemia, looking at etiological types and clinical stages, and we're looking at a variety of headings here, right? We are classifying type 1, type 2, other types, and gestational diabetes in terms of the stage, uh, normal glycemia, and then progression to hyperglycemia, right? Uh, in terms of impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose, which is what we term prediabetes, and then progression to overt diabetes, which is non-insulin requiring, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> got a frog in my throat. <laughs> incident requiring for control and incident requiring for survival. So we know the type 1 diabetes, it progresses from normal glycemia through to prediabetes, through to uh, different stages of diabetes, but inevitably you have to have insulin for survival in type 1 diabetes. Type 2 can progress all the way up to also insulin requiring for control, but it's not absolutely quintessential for survival. Alrighty, <clears throat> here's our fun a uh, pictorial representation of diabetes from medcomic.com. Thank you so much, Mr. Jorge Muniz and company. Uh, so <clears throat> type 1 diabetes has to do with pancreatic beta cell destruction, which leads to absolute, that's the word, absolute insulin deficiency. Rest in peace, beta. Oh, dear. <clears throat> and the way patients present classically is with polyphagia, weight loss, polydipsia, blurry vision, polyuria. Remember, <clears throat> so many of them can actually... <clears throat> I beg your pardon, let's have some water. Mm. By the way, what's Bruce Lee's favorite drink? Water! <clears throat> that was just an aside. Right, many of patients with type 1 diabetes, their normal presentation of diabetes may be in the form of diabetic ketoacidosis, which we will be covering in a subsequent video. Typically, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune process, which may be idiopathic already. So what's the pathogenesis behind this? Although the cause is not yet known, genetics and the environment likely play a role. A genetic component is likely in that 95% of patients with type 1 diabetes have the DR3 or the DR4 allele. There is a 50% concordance rate for monozygotic twins, indicating that early environmental or other factors are involved in expression of disease. Now, type 1 diabetes usually has onset in childhood, so early on. However, there is um, a phenomenology called latent autoimmune diabetes in adulthood, LADA, which occurs occasionally and can be difficult to distinguish from type 2 diabetes mellitus. <clears throat> so a number of disease processes may infiltrate or destroy the pancreatic beta cells and cause the clinical picture of diabetes without the presence of autoantibodies. So just that the pancreas has taken some damage, and these include hemochromatosis, chronic pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis, pancreatic cancer. So here is a beautiful diagram taken from Harrison's, and this demonstrates for us regulation of glucose homeostasis. So we know that glucose is taken up by many cells in the body. It is the primary source of energy to the brain, right? But it's also utilized by the muscle and taken up by that and also by the liver. And the liver converts glucose to glycogen, stores it away. Uh, so it liberates that in times of need, okay? It also, insulin moves into the pancreatic iron itself. Sorry, glucose moves into the pancreatic iron itself and serves the stimulus of glucose production. The iron cells, the alpha cells, uh, also produce glucagon, right, which causes liberation of glucose from the peripheral body stores. Alrighty. Here is a, a diagram illustrating the mechanism, really, of uh, glucose-stimulated insulin secretion and abnormalities in diabetes. So you have glucose right, from a meal that goes into your bloodstream, right? And this is the pancreatic beta cell. So glucose enters via the GLUT1 receptor, and in the nucleus of the cell, glucose undergoes glycolysis, right? <clears throat> so it progresses through to glucose 6-phosphate, eventually to pyruvate, shunts into the mitochondria, and makes up ATP, right? And then we have an ATP-sensitive potassium channel here, right? The SUR receptor is a binding site for some drugs that act as insulin cuticox important, right? And so this then causes depolarization, causing voltage-dependent calcium channels to open, calcium moves in, and together with secondary messages like Inositol triphosphate and dioxyl then stimulates insulin secretion. All right, so this is just illustrating what happens, right, um, when a pancreatic beta cell produces insulin. What are the uh, stimulants for this process, right? Remember that this also stimulates the nucleus to produce islet transcription factors, which causes the um, 
production of insulin essentially. So in type 1 diabetes, there's autoimmune destruction of these beta cells. There could also be genetic defects in beta cell action. And in type 2 diabetes, by and large, there's insensitivity of these beta cells to the circulating uh, glucose, right? Now, as a result, uh, there's uh, an hyperinsulinemic state that is produced and hyperglycemia, all right? This is basically a temporal model for the development of type 1 diabetes mellitus, right? Individuals with a genetic predisposition are exposed to a trigger that initiates an autoimmune process. Uh, I mean, that's what we said, you know, underpins the etiology of type 1 diabetes, genetics and, of course, uh, autoimmunity. And this results in the development of islet autoantibodies and a gradual decline in beta cell function and mass. Now, stage 1 disease, here we are plotting basically on the x-axis is time versus the y-axis being beta cell mass. So we said there's genetic predisposition and immunological trigger, right? And then eventually what we have is reduction in beta cell mass progresses through various stages. And stage 1 is characterized by the development of two or more islet cell autoantibodies, but Normal glycemia is maintained, but as it progresses, we have stage 2, defined by continued autoimmunity and the development of dysglycemia. And stage 3 is the stage where we have overt diabetes, all right, defined by the development of hyperglycemia that exceeds the diagnostic criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes. We'll talk about that just now. This downward slope that we see here of beta cell function varies among uh, people from person to person may not necessarily be continuous. A so-called honeymoon phase may be seen in the first one or two years after the onset of diabetes and is associated with reduced insulin requirements to maintain normal glycemia. But eventually you will end up with overt diabetes mellitus. How do patients present? While well, the initial presentation is often preceded by infection or any other stressors, and examples of these stressors are weight loss, oh sorry, examples <laughs> that patients present with Weight loss, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, dehydration, fatigue. Some of them present with frequent infections in the way of urinary tract infections, osteomyelitis, cellulitis, otitis media, hypertension. Some of them present in overt diabetic ketoacidosis. How do you know a patient has diabetic ketoacidosis? So they have a very high glucose, they have uh, ketones in the urine, and of course they have acidosis on the blood gas. It's metabolic acidosis. And clinically, the patient has cosmal respiration, the deep sighing respiration. <sighs> <laughs> and what we're trying is to blow off, blow off the acid. Severe dehydration, changes in mental status, sweet fruity breath because of ketones, signs of infection or precipitate infection may be present, and blood vision. But we're going to cover diabetic ketoacidosis in a subsequent video, okay? A differential diagnosis for type 1 diabetes can be type 2 diabetes, can be insulin resistance syndrome, gestational diabetes, it could be pancreatic disease in the way of chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic tumor or infection. Could be a systemic disease resulting in pancreatic insufficiency, and we covered this under our table of the varying etiologies, hemochromatosis, cystic fibrosis, hormonal changes, Cushing syndrome, acromegaly, in which we have growth hormone excess, pheochromocytoma, and of course, medication-induced diabetes in the way of thiazides, steroids, beta blockers, and OCPs, oral contraceptive pills. Guys, this is a very important slide. It shows us interpretation of tests used for the screening and more importantly, the diagnosis of diabetes, right? So we talk about a fasting plasma glucose and this is in millimoles per liter. We got the two hour plasma glucose, right? Which is uh, postprandial or after you give a glucose load. Then we talk about the glycated hemoglobin, the HbA1c and the random plasma glucose, right? So for the diagnosis of diabetes, your fasting plasma glucose is definitely greater than or equal to seven millimoles per liter together with or uh, a two-hour uh, postprandial glucose or two-hour post-glucose value of above 11.1 millimole per liter. You've got a glycated hemoglobin above 6.5% and you've got a random plasma glucose above 11.1 millimole per liter. Right. Um, So-called prediabetes uh, is a state where you have impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance. So impaired fasting glucose means that your fasting plasma glucose is between 6 and 6.9 millimole per liter and uh, your two-hour post-glucose value or two-hour post-prandial value is between 7.8 and 11, all right? Diabetes is excluded, essentially, if you have a fasting plasma glucose of below 5.6 millimole per liter, your two-hour plasma glucose level is less than 7.8 millimole per liter, your glycated hemoglobin is below 6.5%, and your random is below 5.6. So remember the cut points of 7 and 11.1, all 
all right? Those are diagnostic of diabetes. A fasting plasma glucose above 7, 2-hour post-glucose load, or a random plasma glucose above 11.1, and glycation hemoglobin above 6.5, all righty? Now, measurement of islet cell antibodies may help distinguish type 1 from type 2 diabetes. We want to screen all patients older than 45 years every three years, right? And even earlier so if they have risk factors or they have symptoms for diabetes. The glycation hemoglobin, the HbA1c level, reflects glucose control over the last three months. Now, the glycation hemoglobin should be checked every three months in diabetic patients, but is not recommended as a screening tool to assess for new onset of diabetes, right? Assess diabetic patients regularly for microvascular complications in that you want to assess the renal function, which can be assessed by the presence of microalbuminuria, but the nomenclature has changed. Microalbuminuria is now called moderately increased albuminuria, which basically is a quantification of 30 to 300 milligrams per 24 hours of albumin, which signifies early stage nephropathy and should be screened for annually. Then you want to do an annual dilated ophthalmological or fundoscopic exam, to, uh, and this is recommended to screen for retinopathy. Then annual podiatric exam will help reduce the incidence of diabetic foot infections. Have a very low threshold of your body for stress testing, as ischemic heart disease may not present in the conventional, typical way with anginal symptoms, like which is chest pain with exertion. These diabetic patients often have atypical chest pain. All right, so these are the guidelines for comprehensive medical care in persons who have diabetes taken from Harrison's, all right, which is basically what we discussed in a different way. You want to individualize your glucose or glycemic goal and therapeutic plan, emphasize self-monitoring at individualized frequency of blood glucose or uh, interstitial glucose, glycating hemoglobin testing about two to four times per year, lifestyle management in the care of diabetes, including diabetes self-management, education and support, nutrition therapy, physical activity, psychosocial care, including evaluation for depression and anxiety, detection, prevention, or management of diabetes-related complications. And we spoke about the annual or biannual diabetes-related eye exam, the foot exam at least one to two times per year, diabetes-related neuropathy examination, the diabetes-related uh, kidney disease testing, and you want to manage or treat diabetes relevant conditions including blood pressure at least two to four times per year, uh, do a lipogram at least once or twice a year, consider antiplatelet therapy with low dose aspirin and influenza, pneumococcal, hepatitis B, coronavirus immunizations already. So here we're looking at um, our targets, our treatment targets according to the risk of the patient. Okay, so we're looking at targets being uh, glycation hemoglobin below 6.5%, less than 7%, or between 7 to 8%. So if your risk of hypoglycemia or drug interactions is low, then really, you know, we should target at least 7%. Now, um, disease duration, if you newly diagnose, you want to be kind of more aggressive, but if it's long standing uh, on the higher side. If your life expectancy is long, you're uh, on a more tight glycemic control, but if short, then, you know, you can provide some leeway for a higher A1C target. If you have major comorbidities, then uh, you know you want to aim for a higher A1C target. Establish macrovascular disease. If it's absent, you can aim lower, but if it's present, then you want to aim higher. Patient attitude, if they're highly motivated, adherent, and have demonstrated good self-care capacity, you want to aim for a tighter A1C target, about less than 6.5%. But if they're not motivated, they're non-adherent, they have poor self-care capability, or if they have uh, something which impairs their memory or function, like a previous CVA, then we can err on the side of being less strict with our A1C target. Resources and support, if it's readily available, you can target lower, but if limited, target higher. All right. And these are the treatment goals for adults with diabetes as per Harrison's. Right. So uh, looking at the A1C in non pregnant adults, right, the goal is below 7.7%, uh, which is 53 millimole per mole. And older or high-risk uh, adults, because they are prone to hypoglycemia and because of hypoglycemic unawareness, our A1C target is not that strict. You can aim for it being around 8%. Aim for a preprandial glucose of between 4.4 and 7.2 millimole per liter, right, uh, in non-pregnant adults. But if it's older or high-risk adults, between 5 and 7.8. And your postprandial two-hour value below 10 is acceptable, right, and, uh, you know, in the younger folks, but in the older, high-risk folks, below 11.1, right. Um, and time in range between 3.9 and 10 millimole per liter in the younger folks, should you should be in that range less than 70% of the time. But in the older folks, you should be in that target range less than, or, or rather greater than 50% of the time. So sorry, you should be 
if you're a youngster, you should be in this target range more than 70% of the time. But if you're older, you should be in that target range at least about 30% of the time. Uh, hypoglycemia, time below 3.9 millimol per liter, you should be in there less than 4% of the time if you're younger and less than 1% of the time if you're older. Glucose variability, which refers to percent coefficient of variation, is less than 36% in the younger folks and less than 33% in the older folks. So a strict diabetic diet, exercise, and insulin therapy are mainstays of treatment. Nutritional recommendations include a diet composed of between 10 to 20% protein, total fat below 30% of daily calories, and less than 10% of that total fat being saturated fat. Auto agents provide no benefit to patients with unequivocal type 1 diabetes. If you type 1 diabetic, there's no sense in taking auto agents. You need insulin for survival. Okay, these are the nutritional recommendations for adults with diabetes or prediabetes. Essentially, in type 1 diabetes, you want to match your intake to your glucose requirements, right? Uh, and you want to dose your insulin appropriately. So general dietary guidelines is vegetable fruits, whole grains, legumes, low-fat dairy products, and food high in fiber, low in glycemic content. Optimal diet composition and eating patterns are not yet known. Fat in the diet, optimal percentage of diet is not known, should be individualized, but what is indeed recommended is a Mediterranean-style diet, rich in mono- and polyunsaturated fatty acids, minimal or no trans fat consumption. In terms of carbohydrates, we need to monitor our carbohydrate intake in relation to calories. That is it. And set limits for meals to reduce postprandial glycemia. Avoid fructose and sucrose-containing beverages like um, you know, fruit juices and uh, carbonated drinks and minimize consumption of foods with added sugar that may displace healthier, more nutrient-dense food choices and elevate postprandial glycemia. Estimate grams of carbohydrate in the diet for flexible insulin dosing. Right. Uh, that is especially true for type 1 diabetics and insulin-dependent type 2 diabetics. Consider using glycemic index to predict how consumption of particular food may affect blood glucose. Ideally, you want to use low GI foods. Protein in the diet we'll talk about in another video. Other components is reduced calories and non-nutritive sweeteners may be useful. Routine supplements of vitamins, antioxidants, or trace elements are not supported by evidence. Sodium intake is advised for the general population. Right? So this is uh, talking about instant preparations that we have available to us in South Africa. Right. So in terms of your basal insulin, there's a whole lot of names we have here. But by and large, in the public health care sector, I'm sure we are familiar with just a few names. Right. So Protophane is the one that we go to. It's a go-to guy. That's an example of an isophane human insulin. It's available as a 3 by 5 mil pen, and the cost is around about 627 rand 47 cents. But it's also, other examples of basal human insulins are human N and bioinsulin. Examples of analog, basal analog insulins are, as mentioned, Levomir, Lantus. Those names are familiar, right? We are familiar with protophane. In terms of the pre-mixed insulins, the one that we are familiar with, uh, in the state sector is actrophane, right? Which is a combination of biosynthetic human insulin, 30% regular insulin, and 70% isophane insulin. And these are the costs of those right there. But I mean, uh, other examples of pre mixed analog insulin includes Humalog and Novomix and uh, Humulin, right? Then looking at the short or rapid acting insulins, right? Here, the one that most of us are familiar with in the way of short acting human insulin is Humulin R. Or act rapid, okay, available. Uh, it's regular human insulin available as a 3 by 5 mole pin, and those are the cost there. But other examples of rapid analog insulins are Apidra, Nova Rapid, Humalog. Uh, I'm sure all of us are familiar with these names. Okay, insulin therapy generally consists of one, either one of three treatment, treatment regimens. The first one is in the way of two daily injections of combination insulin that has a combination of both short and intermediate acting components and the post cell for that is actrophane, which is a mix of 70% intermediate acting with 30% short acting insulin. <clears throat> or you can dose one long acting insulin once daily in the way of glargine or protophane with preprandial insulin. So that's what we call the basal bolus dosing. So the first one we mentioned is the biphasic with the actrophane. The second one is the basal bolus where you have basal insulin and you have bolus uh, short acting insulin. Or you can use an in insulin pump that provides basal insulin with small boluses before meals, right? Samsung recommends that patients use multiple subcutaneous injections at least three times daily for optimal glycemic control. Therefore, use of long acting insulin with preprandial insulin injections is first line therapy in patients who are willing to comply. Patients should ideally monitor the blood glucose four times daily before each of the three meals and once at bedtime. 
And guys, let's talk about prognosis and complications. Exercise is important for patients with type 1 diabetes, but remember they are susceptible to hypoglycemia with vigorous exercise. It is recommended that glucose or glucagon be available during exercise. All patients with type 1 diabetes will inevitably develop diabetic ketoacidosis if their insulin is completely withdrawn. <clears throat> the highest risk for hypoglycemia comes with the use of an insulin pump with patients attempting very strict glycemic control. Skipping meals also will also obviously increase your risk. Now, the risk factors for so-called brittle diabetes that has uh, extreme fluctuations in blood glucose include number one, gastroparesis, number two, malingering, number three, <clears throat> patient communication, number four, or poor patient communication rather, number four, elevated growth hormone. The phenomenon of the smoky effect is also termed rebound hyperglycemia, right, is due to inappropriate release of stress hormones to counter nighttime hypoglycemia and is a partial explanation for continuously elevated blood glucose levels in the mornings, okay. So guys, coming back to our clinical question that we posed earlier. All right. Um, the worldwide prevalence of type 1 and type 2 diabetes is increasing. That is the answer, right? So the worldwide prevalence of diabetes has risen dramatically over the last two decades from an estimated 30 million cases in 1985, which is the year I was born in, <laughs> giving away my age here, to 415 million, which is a staggering prevalence in 2017. Now, based on current trends, the International Diabetes Federation projects that some 642 million individuals will have type 2 diabetes by the year 2040. Now, although the prevalence of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes is increasing worldwide, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is rising much more rapidly, presumably because of number one, increasing obesity, <clears throat> number two, and reduced activity levels as countries become progressively more industrialized, and uh, three, is aging of the population. <clears throat> okay, my friends, I hope that you allow me to just take a few moments to encourage you from the Bible. We're going to be talking about love for the world, or the lack thereof. First John 2, 15-17 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from this world. The world and its desires are passing away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Indeed, what we see, my friends, whatever we see in the world is merely temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The Lord Jesus said that we should build up ourselves treasures in heaven where rust and moth do not corrode, where thieves do not break in and steal. Indeed, we should prepare ourselves for eternity and for life with the Lord. And I pray that we will live a holy life, a righteous life, but not something on our own accord, only by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us when we submit ourselves to the Lord. These are my references. Have yourself a wonderful day. I will catch you soon with another uh, uh, handy video on internal medicine. You can catch me on Facebook. My uh, page on Facebook is entitled Internal Medicine Algorithms and Mnemonics. You can also catch me on YouTube, obviously, <laughs> and uh, on TikTok and also on Instagram. Alrighty, have yourself a fantastic day. God bless you.